welcome to the Your Data Driven Podcast. If you like this podcast, be sure to visit our website at yourdatadriven.com for more useful help and advice on setting up your race car, mastering data analysis, and driving faster. Welcome to episode six. Today I'm talking to Damien Harty, professional chassis engineer with a whole load of experience developing racing cars and particularly rally cars. Having worked at ProDrive, he has worked with some of the best world rally drivers ever, such as world champion Peter Solberg. We discuss what it takes to drive a rally car and what you can learn from that to improve your own racing. We also discuss race car setup and also the often misunderstood role of damper to discuss how it works and what makes one damper better than another so that you can take that knowledge back to your own racing and your own understanding when you're doing your own vehicle setup this is a fascinating episode so let's hear what he has to say hello damien uh, hello samir how are you doing i'm very well well thank you very much for joining us on the show i'm, I'm really excited about this conversation and uh, i hope everyone else will be as well um, you have an absolutely fascinating background and history within automotive and motorsports which i'm sure people will find really really as we discussed a little bit ahead of time, you know, it'd be interesting to see from an amateur level what people could take away from some of your experiences doing sort of a professional engineering, both in terms of developing cars and vehicle dynamics, rally cars, uh, and some of the other uh, elements you've done as well in terms of communicating and the teaching and all sorts of stuff. So I mean, maybe if you could start off, just to give us a bit of a background on, on who you are and, what you're, and you know, what you're up to. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I don't, I don't imagine that anyone listening to this will actually have uh, have heard of me. So I'm 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 a legend in my own mind. I've done quite a few different things. I've uh, I've looked at circuit cars and world rally cars and road cars and uh, military vehicles and motorcycles and so on. Uh, and always from a, a kind of an overall behaviour point of view, as as well as uh, some of the kind of um, the, the bits and pieces. And uh, it's, it's that kind of system level thinking and how the how the vehicle interacts with the human to achieve its task is is what I find really fascinating. And it's it's interesting looking across all of those different classes of vehicles, what you can find that's common, um, and then where some of the differences are. And uh, that that's been really educational. I think the most educational part for me though has been the world rally cars because that seems to be every difficult thing all in one vehicle. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, what makes them, what makes them difficult? I mean, just just for the benefit, I mean, so people may not know you, but they they may well be aware of companies like ProDrive and such like. And you know, if they have any interest in the World Rally, they may be familiar with the Mini and and some other rally cars that you've done. But you know, what what, what makes it difficult? So um, there's there's a there's a couple of really key things. Uh, one is the fact that the the terrain is very rough, which means there's just a huge amount of energy sloshing around vertically, um, that uh, that really stops you keeping the wheels on the ground effectively. And a lot of people don't realise, but on a, a sort of a fairly tif- typical um, gravel uh, event of sort of typical roughness, the wheels only on the ground about half the time. And uh, it, it's not that obvious when you watch the cars, but, but that's that's one of the reasons, as well as the marbles rolling around under the tire. Um, just the fact that the tire's not sort of firmly loaded up is is one of the big reasons why there's a lot less grip compared to um, what's available on a on a smooth track. So that that's one big uh, obstacle. And then the other one is the fact that it's so unrehearsed, uh, and and so you've got. Um, You've got more more corners in a uh, a typical world rally event than you have in an entire season of Formula One, um, by quite a handsome amount actually. Um, <clears throat> and um, the uh, the the what that means is that the sort of rehearsal that goes into circuit driving and you know finding the perfect brake point and finding the perfect turning point and all of that stuff. It kind of goes out of the window, and and so the rally stage is a, a kind of a connected series of near crashes, and the person, <laughs> <laughs> the person that can kind of sail closest to the wind without actually falling off the edge of the road is is the person. They are pretty committed. <laughs> they are they are pretty they are pretty committed. Uh, I, I've been lucky enough to uh, to sit next to 
uh, many of them actually. And um, yeah, d- committed is is definitely a, a word that I would use. You know, the, this the w- what that means for the car. What you want is a a high level of capability, but you don't want any kind of nastiness or knife edge behaviour because in the end you don't quite know the surface that you're travelling on and the and the terrain that you're going to present it to. You only know in a sort of a statistical way that, you know, Finland has uh, higher speeds than uh, Cyprus, let's say, or something like that. Um, but you, you can't really sort of uh, optimise things in the way that you can for circuit racing. And so what you end up trying to do is generate this big friendly plateau um, where the car is is kind of not terrible at anything that the driver attempts. But they don't they pay, the the co drivers and stuff have have a sort of a, a, a code you know with the notes of different types of corner. So at least there's some some level of commonality in terms of maybe a corner radius or corner style or a hairpin or such like. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> they 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 do have those notes, um, but I, I would I would like you to sort of imagine. Uh, you know, go, going out in a in a in a car on a track you've never driven before, um, and having someone next to you saying left a bit, right a bit, and and expecting you to set a competitive time on your first lap. And, and don't they sit below the dashboard so they can't actually see out anyway? <laughs> yeah, I I used to find that very helpful because it stopped me being quite so frightened because I couldn't actually see what was going on. Um, yeah, they are slightly lower in the car because everything that lowers the CG helps. And uh, yeah, and they they can kind of you know track broadly where the car is with the the you know the the seat of their pants and uh, and and the trees flying by in in the sort of top of their vision. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, they they usually um, so so what happens? It, it's it's different at different levels of the sport. Um, so at some levels of the sport, the organisers will provide pace notes. Um, but at the at the world championship level, uh, the the drivers go out typically on the Tuesday um, with the co driver, and they'll they'll go out in a a rental car or or a recce car. Um, you wouldn't believe how fast some rental cars will go. Well, I, I, I was you brought it up, not me. I was like, <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> but anyway, they they go out when the roads are still open. Um, and and the driver will drive along and 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 basically kind of talk out loud. Uh, and say things like, you know, 80 left three into dip caution, do not cut opens into crest five, blah, blah, blah. And, and so they talk in this code um, and they're basically talking about the distance to the next thing. The, so the, the number that you hear that's sort of high tens or, or, or hundreds is, is a, a distance typically in meters. It depends on, you know, what, what the driver prefers. Um, to the next thing, <clears throat> uh, they obviously le- left and right is pretty obvious. It's kind of which way the next bend goes, and then they 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 often use some sort of numerical system, which is based on their kind of estimated level of commitment. Um, and so, if if you can just keep your foot in, um, that's going to be a five or a six. Um, it, it's sort it, so, some people notionally think about which gear you're going to attack the corner in, but it is really about um uh you know how, how much you've got to pay attention so if you just come out of a six and now you have a three you know you're going to have a fairly big braking event whereas if you just come out of a six and it's a five maybe a lift will do it um and so the, the drivers are making a judgment the whole time while they're driving at actually fairly normal speeds on on roads that are open to the public um they're making a judgment about what they're going to do in three days time of course the surface typically changes um, because when they when they go out on Tuesday, the road is sort of how it normally is. Uh, whereas for a gravel road, once you've had a few rally cars down it, they're very good at digging up the roads and relocating all the gravel into the spectators' hats and things like that. <laughs> so the the road is is kind of really different as well. So there's quite a lot of guesswork in the pace notes. So it's not the um, um, it, it'll stop you turning right when you should have turned left, and it'll stop you you know driving off a cliff hopefully. Um, but it's not a very precise thing. It's more like an aid memoir. I understand. But what would make a good platform or what would make a good setup? So the the perfect rally car would have uh, sort of fairly awesome levels of suspension travel, uh, perhaps like a trophy truck. Oh, wow. It would have fairly, fairly magical uh, body control. Uh, it would also um, 
turn very very quickly so that the, uh, the, the it would respond very well to the driver's steer inputs um so so where most cars have uh they, they can't keep up with you if you if you steer i'm going to say more than about once a second uh the car starts to lag what you're doing um uh, uh, uh you know uh, the really ideal perfect magic car would would keep up for five steer inputs a second um uh, which is about as fast as you, as you can get a get a human to do. I was going to say, I think I think you, I remember you saying something along those lines before, saying that was the difference between you and me and a professional rally driver is that they can they can maintain and input steering at a much higher rate. Yeah, and it, it isn't because they they've got sort of magic arms or anything because the 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 sort of biomechanical bandwidth of their arms is the same, but they they're so practiced at, at manipulating the motion of the car um, that they make a kind of a large number of small corrections. And so when you sit with them in the car, they look really busy, but when you watch the car from the outside, it flows gracefully uh in a you know a way that looks sort of a cross between witchcraft and and uh flying or something yeah yeah it's it sort of yeah it looks like a kind of magical hovercraft or something um as it is it sort of wiggles and turns um and and the fact that they do this kind of corner after corner after corner after corner for for three days solid uh is really really impressive and, and the other thing that um uh, people maybe miss is that the between the stages they drive the rally car on the road between the stages uh, so it has to be a perfectly capable ordinary road car as well and you know it can't overheat in traffic and things like that optionally optionally all wheels are required <laughs> sometimes yeah, yeah that, that's that's you know most of the time they do want most of the wheels i will say yeah yeah um, so so let, let's roll back a little bit because i we, we sort of jumped into the rally stuff, which I think is so fascinating. I'm sure people are eager to hear much more about it. But but how did you how did you get into that, and, and what's your contribution? So I, I sort of um, I, I didn't really um, uh, arrive in it through a, any any kind of grand plan. I just took a sort of a series of small decisions that inched me closer and closer. And then you know one one day I was I was sat in a rally car with Petter Solberg, thinking, "Golly, I'm getting paid for this." He always comes across as a nice guy. He he was a lovely guy. He was uh, amazingly intense to work with. I'll say that. Um, but uh, but a lovely, you know, a nice a nice guy. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I carry a lot of affection for him still. Um, but yeah, I, I started looking at uh, the sort of strength and and fatigue behavior of suspension components, and then. Um, uh, started looking at kind of suspension geometry with Ford and and uh, doing a lot of computer based analysis and and computer based analysis is a a really good tool for teaching you that you don't quite know what the question is uh, and, and that's um, I have some experience of that. <laughs> that that was the most valuable lesson I I took from all of this computer analysis uh, a little bit like douglas adams you know in his uh, the meaning of life the problem is you don't really know what the question is and and there's a lot of that in vehicle dynamics um and so people get fixated on on sort of surrogate things or or something that's not that doesn't really move the needle very much um and and you can see some uh i'll say strange and interesting decisions that people make when they fixate on one specific thing instead of uh, keeping the whole in mind, which is really about having the car do what the driver wants. And then uh, if the car does what the driver wants and you put the right driver in it, then you're running out of excuses not to win at that point. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Because we, we had a little chat beforehand and, and you were talking about corners and prioritizing corners for drivers. And some of your well, what would you tell you, you tell us? Share, share your thoughts on that because I, I think it's slightly different to what some of the common what you might call common knowledge is around corner and how to approach it. Sure. So, so I, I don't think I've got anything kind of uh, magical in terms of finding a line through a given corner. I think my my uh, understanding of that is is sort of pretty similar to most people's. But I think the the thing that a lot of people miss is if you look at a, a speed trace over a lap. Um, you, you've basically kind of got uh, three things that you do. You 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 accelerate, you brake, you turn, and then you repeat that. 
uh, maybe 10 times in a typical sort of short circuit lap. And, and if you imagine uh, looking at each of those phases in detail, the, the one that people are obsessed with is really braking. And, and they're obsessed with braking because it makes them place it in a, in a competitive race. And so I, I fully understand the desire to be able to make uh, kind of tactical braking decisions. But if you actually look at the duration of the braking as a proportion of the whole lap, it's pretty small. Um, it, it's maybe sort of, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 percent. It depends a little bit on the circuit. Um, but because it's it's uh, it's very effective at scrubbing speed off, you don't need to do it for long. And so if you improve your braking performance, you can only improve that relatively small portion of the whole lap. Even if you make your brake performance kind of interstellar, um, you still haven't changed the lap time very much. And then if you look at driving out of the corner, uh, that's a, a, a bigger advantage because it, it sort of integrates up to a speed advantage down the straight. And so unless you're flat out, you also carry that advantage. But if you look at the mid-corner speed, um, the kind of apex speed uh, that you see on a, uh, on a data trace, the lowest point, um, if you lift that by one mile an hour, then the entire speed trace lifts by one mile an hour um, because you can, uh, you know, you can break from one mile an hour faster and do the same braking and you can drive out of the corner at the, at the same speed. So um, mid corner speed in terms of a lap time advantage is, is really critical. Uh, and, and I think a, a lot of people miss the fact that it, it gives you, you know, and it is literally every mile an hour on your mid corner speed is a one mile an hour on your average lap time uh, or lap pace. So it, it's <clears> really, um, it, it's very strongly worth pursuing. Right. I mean, because it's sort of, it, it's connected to braking, of course, because, but it's about not, I suppose, not when you go onto the brakes, but when you're coming off the brakes, I think is maybe more of the, how people would translate that idea, that concept into something practical that they can do. It's and and it's sort of, but how do where, how do I how do I come off the brake so I'm one mile an hour quicker, on average through this section or something like that? Because I can see what you mean. If you lift the whole trace yeah. up, it's the same. It's the same shape as it was before. It's just higher for that whole yeah. duration, which means that you're you're faster for a significantly proportion of the lap. Yeah. So so there's kind of uh, there, there's two there's two. Th- things one one is in a given car on a given track you're looking for a line that gives you the highest possible mid corner speed and and um, oh, okay the difference yeah. between a, a good driver and a brilliant driver is instinctively finding the lines that help them carry speed um uh, and and it's easy if you start obsessing about braking late um you become fixated on on the point you apply the brakes um and and you think less and less about your line and in fact the more you stress yourself the less you think about the line and so um for me if i'm if i'm ever in a in a sort of a you know a competitive environment in a car um one of the ways i can tell uh, that someone in front of me is getting stressed is they start to turn in early and it's okay. because their their uh their sort of stress levels are going up and turning in comforts them and reduces the stress level uh, but of course as as uh, as many people know when you uh, if you turn in too early, you end up kind of running wide on the exit of the corner, and then you have to turn in again at the point where actually you should have been driving out of the corner. Uh, and so that's a you know that's an error that costs you a lot of mid corner speed. Um, so so the the driving thing is about picking the right line, and and it's uh, um, you know there there are there are mathematical things you can do, but to be honest, good drivers can kind of smell the right line, and and you can look at the. Uh, look at the data that you're getting. If, even if you've got a, just kind of Harry's lap timer on your cell phone, um, you can look at the data and you can kind of decouple the corners from each other. So you can work on a single corner until you get that corner as fast as it's going to go. And then you remember what you do there and then move on to kind of, you know, the, the next most difficult corner. Um, another thing to say there is that the slowest corners are the corners that you spend the most time in. Uh, uh, when you're traveling over a given distance. So the, the slowest corners are where the, the biggest benefits come. Everybody has in mind that it's all about um, kind of the, the, you know, the, the fastest corners, but actually the, from, from a strictly mathematical point of view, the slowest corners are the ones where, where you can make the biggest gains because you just spend the longest time in them. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's an interesting way of putting it. Sorry um, to jump in, but it's, that's an interesting way of putting it because a lot of people say, "Oh, the the most important corner is the one that goes onto the longest straight." That's that's quite commonly said. But but what, what your your the way in which you're thinking about the lap is different because you're thinking about the, the time spent in each event. I call it. So yeah, corner is an event. And and you look at the proportion of your time, your your whole lap time spent doing that event, right? In the slower corners, you're going to spend more time in. Yes. Uh, okay. It, it's actually for for quite a lot of circuit layouts, it turns out that the slowest corner is the one that leads on to the longest straight. Yeah. Um. And so there's a sort of a happy confluence in those in those kind of. Uh, um, these statements, I guess. Yeah. Um, but then the, the the other thing I was going to say was that from an engineering point of view, it means that when you're trying to develop the car, you should really be working really hard on mid corner grip. And and when you've got um, mid corner grip right, you can uh, divert your attention to some other things like you know how does the car turn in, for example. And a lot of drivers are really obsessed with how the car turns in. Um, but to be honest, as a driver you can adapt to more or less anything. Um, the, just the very existence of Porsche 911s proves that, surely. Um, all, all the Porsche so, guys are going, oh, I don't need it or I'm a hero. Or, or, some, or they've all subs- unsubscribed. One of the two, they've all gone out. Oh, yeah, no one criticizes yeah, the yeah, Porsche sorry, 911. Sorry, I've just, I've just uh, <laughs> alienated half you. So, so, someone I know who drives very well want, once said to me of 911s, you spend your whole time trying to get them to turn in, and then when they do, you wish they hadn't. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, that's that's kind of. Uh, but, but anyway, so so the, <laughs> the, there's a kind of an obsession in in sort of turning behaviour, and people are fiddling with dampers and and uh, springs and bars and all of this um, to get the turning decisive. When in reality, that's a really tiny fraction of the lap, and that's not really where your lap comes from, unless the car turns in so badly that it hinders you from taking the line you want. Then you should just kind of get over it and and leave the car alone. You should be totally fixated on mid corner speed, and you should be kind of balancing the car for fastest mid corner speed and working on your damper settings to get, uh, you know, the 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 best grip mid corner, and and everything else is is kind of small beer. So you raise a good point on dampers. So um, dampers are a strange piece of equipment for most people. Even I, and I, in fact, I know enough about dampers to know that I still don't know about dampers. And um, I work for a damper company, so <laughs> for a little while. But I think you've done a little bit on damping, and particularly with a rally car, I think that that really focuses the mind on the damping. If you, if you were teaching or teaching someone or explaining something to someone about a damper, what is it doing? Not in, in, its, in its function, but in its per, in its purpose. Yeah. So what what do they do, and then why are they useful in a racing environment? Sure. So, so for any for any kind of wheeled vehicle traveling on a non-smooth surface, the 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 um, the the terrain effectively moves up and down under the vehicle. Even tarmac is or a curb. Yeah, or- yeah, and and any you know unless it's um, unless it's kind of uh, I don't know glass or something. Okay. Um, the, the you know there are there are no really really smooth surfaces. There are just sort of rougher and less rough surfaces. Um, and and in fact, there's a uh, if you take just a wheel and tire and roll it down a hill and watch, um, you'll see that what happens is it starts rolling down the hill and then it, as it kind of gets faster, it starts jumping off the road. Yeah. And, uh, and and kind of most of us can imagine that. You know, we've seen a wheel and tire rolling. Um, I'm sure I've seen a clip on YouTube of a, a wheel coming off a race car and, it, and it's got enough speed that it ends up basically jumping the fence into the crowd. There's kind of energy in the road surface pushing the wheels up and down all the time. And um, if we don't manage that energy, then the wheel ends up losing contact with the road. And so the purpose of the dampers is to throw that energy overboard, basically turn it into heat and then and then uh, convect or radiate the heat away from the car. And um, that that starts off as kind of it, its primary task, but then you you start looking very carefully, and you end up with these conflicting objectives of um, doing it in such a way that the motion of the body is very smooth, which is the kind of the Rolls Royce challenge, 
and then uh, doing it in such a way that we annoy the tire not very much, which is the motorsport challenge. So, so um, the the function of the damper is to try and minimise load variation. You can't ever remove it because the surface is not smooth, but you're trying to minimise load variation. And um, the first thing that you can do is just give yourself enough travel. The moment you start running out of travel, the the car starts scampering off very small bumps. Um, so uh, Australian touring cars, for example, have quite a lot of suspension travel compared to most circuit cars because they're forever riding curbs, and they and that's the you know the style of that event. And the curbs are pretty rough. Or, or touring cars in the UK. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <clears throat> and then and then kind of uh, you know tar- tarmac rally cars are they're actually on kind of not on graded uh, circuits, and so there's there's kind of even more energy in the surface on a on a sort of a, a public road that's been closed for an event. Um, and then by the time you get to you get to gravel, there's just even more energy in the surface. But the the character of it is all very similar across all these different surfaces. Yeah. Um, it's just sort sort of scaled. Uh, so the 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 kind of the right place to be for the damping characteristics is surprisingly similar between uh, gravel and tarmac. Um, but the the obviously the kind of the the uh, you, you you have very big travel for gravel, and so you need soft springs to encourage the wheel to use all of that travel, um, but but not more than all of it, which is the trick in choosing spring rates. Uh, and, and so um, you, you end up putting a lot of effort into understanding how the damper manages that energy. And, and one of the key pieces of learning out of the rally cars was the way the damper changes direction is at least as important as the shim stack. What, what's what's the shim stack for the benefit for the benefit of the tape? Yeah, sorry, <clears throat> the the shim stack is um, the the damper is basically um, a, a, a bad bicycle pump. I love these analogies, David. That's awesome. They are brilliant. <laughs> I mean, like you've just got you. Oh, do you have them written down somewhere? I mean, there's just there's like a long list of these brilliant analogies. You just think, oh yeah, that's another good one. <laughs> <laughs> So, so it's it's like a, a bad bicycle pump with holes in the piston, and uh, you cover the holes with with sort of uh, washers, effectively, and they're very thin washers, um, and they're so thin that people can't be bothered to call them washers; they call them shims, but really they're just washers. And uh, and and you you pile them on top of one another to get the kind of stiffness characteristic that you want, so that you restrict the flow of oil in the uh, in the way that you want, and that's one of the things that shapes the the sort of force velocity characteristics of of the damper, um, and a lot of people are obsessed with this this sort of force velocity curve as describing the damper fully, um, but but it it actually it doesn't. The way the damper changes direction, and there, there's some little valves um, that flow the oil on different paths depending on whether the damper is going one way or the other. And these check valves, as they're called, uh, they end up having a, a hugely important um influence uh on on the damper behavior and and anyone who's who's uh worked with um rally dampers will know that if if your check valves are not behaving well um specifically if they're too stiff you can just drill a little hole in the piston you can get a kind of a one mil or one and a half mil drill bit and just poke a bleed hole in the piston and it sort of covers up the fact that the check valve is (laughs) is too stiff uh it's it's a bit of a cheap trick and i i don't i don't like doing it because it's quite difficult to fill that hole back in again when you discover that you've made it too big yeah. um and and in fact some <laughs> of the characteristics that you uh <laughs> some of the characteristics that you want to put in the check valve are a bit more sophisticated than a uh than a than just a bleed hole um but it is uh um you know the the way the damper changes direction turns out to be as important as the the basic force characteristics of it so theoretically the damp is only working when the suspension is moving into bump or rebound or up and down. Yeah. Theoretically. And effectively what I'm sort of taking from what you're saying is that there's more going on here. So the the damper still has an influence even when it's, it shouldn't be. Yeah. 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 That is exactly what I'm, yeah, that is exactly what I'm saying is, is that it's that, that little, uh, that little moment where the damper comes to rest and gets ready to, to go the other way, it can really annoy the tire in that moment if it behaves badly. Whereas if it behaves well, uh, it gives the tire a really easy time. 
I've talked to people before, and they're like, "Well, hang on, you've got the whole car pressing down on the on the tire, and and you know, got the spring, and it's all there. So, what what's this? What's this about? Why is the tire ever going to be leaving the road surface? And I think it's because when you when because it's a spring, when you push it down, it it, it comes back up of and and it goes past the point of where it started from. If you see what I mean, and I think yeah, yeah, the concept of the damper is to sort of manage that. Uh, relationship such that it, it minimizes it but without upsetting it too much if that's a not too much of a hand wavy basic information no, no, that, that's <laughs> yeah that, that, that's that's pretty good and the the other thing um that you you need to kind of get in your head is instead of thinking of just the car going up and down um you've got to think of the wheel moving up and down on the tire as well so there's okay. there's kind of two two springs uh, and and two things going on. One one is the car going up and down on the road spring, um, and and one is the the wheel jumping up and down on the tire spring. And the and the wheel jumping up and down. Uh, sometimes we call that wheel hop, mm. um, as a as a kind of a description. That that happens kind of twelve or fifteen times a second, and it's very difficult to detect for the driver. Um, but if you don't manage the energy in that uh, motion then the tyre kind of dithers itself off the road um, in a way that the driver just can't detect, but but you give up an awful lot of grip. And and you can do a, a, a little test to convince yourself of that. Um, if, you, uh, if you basically take the oil out of the damper yeah. uh, and, and run the car, particularly if you do it one end of the car, obviously there's a really sort of comic bouncing effect of the car yeah. but if you just sort of get get over that and ignore that if you just drive on a relatively smooth piece of road and give the car really smooth inputs you'll find that the end where you've taken the oil out very smoothly lets go and has got only somewhere between a half and two thirds of the grip that it had before it's a really shocking change and you can't really feel that the wheels chattering um, but but it is it, it's doing it enough to to give away um, really quite a lot of grip, and and so the the management of that energy is the that's the kind of invisible thing um, that people miss, and that uh, that's the thing where you need to get to the bottom of the the science and use whatever data you can, um, and and work on uh, improving the 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 load control in the tire. Because the well, there's two, there's two things that have popped into my head. One, one about wheel balancing as a concept. Yep. Because from now, now that you're saying this, I'm thinking it makes that process even more important. That you know, when you put a new tire on, you, you're getting a fully balanced wheel, or if if your wheel gets a, a knock somehow, yep. or, the, or even the tire rotates on 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 the on the wheel rim somehow, that's going to yep. affect yep. all of that balance, which then it's going to feed into this system. It's going to feed more energy yes. into the system. So it's effectively yeah. you you heading more towards a gravel stage than you heading more towards the glass. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, and 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 so that 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 that's something to be aware of. Um, and and the the other thought uh, I had, which has now gone out of my head, of course. Well, this is it. One of the things with dampers is that they're it's they're treated almost like a. Um, they're treated as a tuning device, and I think possibly sometimes confused with the spring, because it's more yeah. difficult to yeah. change a spring in, when you're sitting in, you know, in the in the paddock than it, if you don't have a too big one. <clears throat> yeah, than it is uh, a couple of clicks on the damper. Yeah, yeah. What do you think about people's approach when they say, "Well, it's raining, so I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to just take all the damping off, or, or t- you know, reduce it as much as possible"? Is that the right thing to be doing? Soft, effectively, notionally softening the car. So, I, I, th- this has always fascinated me. Um, I, I think that um, I think there are like, like a lot of things that go on. There are some aspects of merit, um, but all the science that I've done on all the different surfaces that I've worked on says that particularly for high speed damping um which is the one that really dominates the grip because the wheel bounces up and down very very fast so it's a it's a you know very much a kind of a a, a, a high speed phenomenon um although not notwithstanding that it connects to this direction change behavior yeah. because because for these rapid events there are many more direction changes per second so the the uh the check valve behavior really dominates but anyway there there is one kind of setup that gives you the best grip. So having found that, 
why would you go away from it because it's raining? Or alternatively, why wouldn't you use the setup that you like in the rain to give you the best grip in the dry? And I've never really understood uh, the, why people are messing with high-speed settings. Now, there's a different thing. The kind of the low-speed settings are really about the control of the platform of the car, how, how when you put your foot on the brakes, it goes forward. When you steer, it, it rolls and so kind on. Kind of a low-transfer type situation where you – Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's, there's a lot of that. That's, of course, hugely apparent to a driver who's paying attention. And so um, the comforting thing about tweaking the low speed adjusters is that you can feel that you've done something. Um, but that, that doesn't necessarily make the car uh, particularly faster. So I'm, I'm always, I, I'm kind of basically fascinated, a, apart from the fact that if you let the car roll, more you maybe give away some camber on the outside wheels and so on um i'm sort of fascinated by the idea that people make the cars soft in the wet and then turn it back up again in the dry because it, it i feel like one or other setting was the correct setting and there's just a different level of friction under the car um and and the camber stuff you you should be able to do uh, statically. So if people say, I'm going to take off some static camber, for example, in the wet, because I want the footprint to be square so that I can brake better in the wet, I would say, yeah, I, Isaac Newton agrees with you there. <laughs> but you're right that the the kind of, you know, the, the habit of clicking dampers is, is people doing something um, that they, you, you know, that, that they know and that they like um, un- unless you're doing a really blind experiment, of course, if if you think that you go faster by clicking the dampers, then quite a lot of the time there's a strong connection between how fast you think you go and how fast you go, particularly if you think you'll be slower if you don't do it, and then you don't do it, then you really will be slower if you don't do it. And so that that's you're only testing your thinking against your thinking, and it's quite difficult to break into that psychology. Um, unless you start doing some blind testing. Well, the other thing that you do, uh, and you mentioned the mouse a little bit, um, is the simulation. Yeah. And again, again, we had a little a little chat about this before because um, I've got a bit of a background in it, and, and, and you do as well, uh, more much more than I do, to be honest. That's a really a, a really big thing that's missing from club and amateur level racing. Uh, there are there are some tools available for people to use, but they are still a little bit exclusive. I would say so. What's your thoughts on that? I mean, are they worth it for people? Or how have you you used simulation to to sort of make that scientific? Because engineers, we we love all the science, but we're also a bit lazy, I think, myself. Anyway, and and so we we like to do it once and then not bother. We don't want to have to redo that every time. So we sort of, we do it, we we work it out, and then we'll we'll create some maths, which means that we can just, we just twiddle the inputs and and get the output. We We don't want to, have to do, do all the workings out again and that's basically what simulation is. so for me it just seems an obvious thing to do but what what's your experience so um the, the first thing i have to say is that the way my head works is really analytical okay. and and so uh for me to um to get a grip on something i quite like to see it either algebraically or numerically um I, I, as i've got older i've got less and less interested in algebra and more and more interested in in numbers particularly when you've got kind of digital computers that can crunch a lot of numbers very quickly you can generate uh, uh if you can kind of scribble down some equations of motion you can generate numerical solutions to them really fast and you can do it with excel you don't need anything super fancy to do it that's great for me to to get a bit of a, a kind of a smell for it but there's another um, I'm going to say category of person who doesn't work like that. We could maybe call them normal, for for example. Um, and uh, uh, I meet lots of people who've got a sort of fantastic instinctive um, understanding of things, but don't can't you know can't write algebra whatsoever. And I, I work with a fantastic guy on the rally team who had this incredible amount of of insight and intuition. Uh, he, he and I used to work very well together because uh, he, his insight would kind of um, goad me into thinking about what the question was. And then uh, w- once we agreed between us what the question was, um, I could do some, um, I'll call it kind of filtering using simulation to say, okay, I think this, this, and this test 
are really interesting, but those are the 10 tests. They're not really interesting. So let's not waste our time doing them. Actually, that's an example that I've often used with simulation is that, that you know, it, it's not going to give you the answer. It's not, it's not the specific thing. That's the wrong way to look at it. But if you've got an option, of, you've got 10 options, it might tell you the three to focus on, which is work, which I still think is valuable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, so there was a a famous uh, statistician called George Box who said that uh, all models are wrong. Some models are useful. And I'm uh, I'm I'm massively keen on useful models. But I long ago got over the fact that every single one of them is wrong. Um, uh, And sometimes people want to kind of doorstep me and, and triumphantly tell me that they're wrong. But I already knew that. But this is relevant as well to to data. The data will 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 tell you what's happened and it will then then there'll be some theory and such like that will go well how this is how you interpret the data and i personally think people struggle who aren't experienced and aren't used to the fact that these numbers are a suggestion rather than the answer yeah i think i think people struggle with that because they think one well you know one plus one is two and it's like well in this case it's not quite the same and the way I like to put it to people is um, imagine, you know, you and me, we're sitting around the table trying to make a decision on something and data is just another chair at the table. It's like a, the empty chair at the table and it's just giving another opinion to that conversation. Sometimes I feel like that works. But again, other times people just go, well, the numbers, I've been told by all these people that the data is going to tell me how, how to drive faster or how to set my car up better. And it's difficult to almost un- unpick that sometimes. Sort of yeah, yeah. And simulation is, is another another one on for that because you haven't even got a real, that's not even real data, it's sort of made up numbers. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. But all, all of these things, I think you have to, you, you, exactly as you say, you have to see them as, as kind of one of several tools in the box. And, and you know, any anybody who says, if you just spend $5,000 on this data acquisition setup, your, your life will be, changed i i would say you might want to walk away from them um i i feel like you know genuinely the thing to do is to get harry's lap timer out and and to just spend a lot of time on one particular circuit and start saying um what what are the obstacles to speed on this circuit what what do i feel they are psychologically and what does the data show me and do they overlap do they contradict each other you know what what's going on here and um uh, if you're if you're really canny and a little bit imaginative, you can get two cell phones and you can Velcro one to the steering wheel and have one in the car. Um, and uh, you, you need to you do need to do a bit of footwork to get it to work, but you can uh, you can work out the difference between what you're asking for with the steering wheel um, and what the car is actually doing. And and that's a that's a key a uh, key thing because the car the car can't keep up with the driver. And so, um, seeing everywhere that the the kind of the car is is not keeping up or is diver- diverging from what the driver is asking for, um, that's quite a good way to understand uh, weaknesses in in performance. I think, and that's something that's something very practical people can do. I like the yeah. idea of doing one one minus the other because uh, I mean you can nationally get sort of steering wheel angle that way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and there's a there is a bit of footwork to do. You do need to do some kind of vector transformation, blah blah blah. But uh, but but it's it's possible. Oh, that's, I like that idea actually. I, I have actually played um, with iPhones in the past, trying to make them into data loggers. Yeah, there's a lot to be said for using using these kind of the tools that are around you to to get the best out of it. I, I just I just feel sometimes people are a bit overwhelmed with the numbers and the squiggly lines and. The, and how to translate that into something real? I mean, if, just yeah. to fl- flip back to the to the drivers that you've worked with, even the professional level drivers. How do they? How have they coped, or how do they work with the data? I mean, do they, or is that something they they looked at? So um, uh, sometimes, if if the drivers feel like um, they're having a specific problem on a on a specific corner, either on a circuit or or on a test stage, typically with the rally car, where you where you attack the same corners again and again, um, you know, they might say something like that. That run felt like it was loads better, but I don't know if it was. Can we look at the data? Um, and you can do a sort of, you know, lap, lap for lap o- over overlay, as it were. And oh yeah, look, I'm carrying much more speed here. Um, or no, actually, they they were the same. It just felt better. Okay, that's weird. I'll just try not to fox myself anymore. Um, but they don't. They don't typically. They're, they're typically not kind of data guys. And so they 
don't typically burrow into the data. Um, so what we're trying to do as engineers is get them to talk about what does the car do that you wish it didn't and how can we help? Um, that That's the kind of a, approach that we're normally um, taking. And, and it'll be things like, you know, mid-corner understeer in the low low speed corners and all, all that stuff that everybody's sort of frustrated by. Where they're, where they're just eager to get back on the throttle and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And and so, you know, we, we might say, okay, let's, uh, you know, let's put a, a different ramp in the diff or let's put a, a bigger bar on or, you know, whatever. Uh, let's change the camber, uh, all, all the stuff that people do. Um, and then quite often you, you find, oh, yeah, that, that's much faster, but the overall time was slower because um, we, we sped it up in that one bend, but we slowed it down in the other nine bends. <laughs> um, and so sometimes there's a sort of a case for kind of talking them down from obsessing over one particular thing. Um, and that, that's an interesting dynamic. You have to kind of win, win their confidence to get them to believe you. Any tips for that for the engineers listening? Um, I, I think you have to nod a lot and say, oh, I know, oh, I know. Uh, um, but yeah, <clears throat> the, the, the worst thing, honestly, the worst thing you can do is is kind of be dismissive. Um, we we used to, when, when I was working with the, uh, the touring car team, the, the Mondeo touring car team, so this is a, you know, a million years ago, um, there, were, there were two drivers. They were both really lovely guys. One was Alan Menu and uh one was anthony reed and uh when when we first started when we got the car out of the box it had a few glitches that we'd inadvertently built into it and and the car was was uh, miserably difficult to handle and the data traces were really comic um and uh we, we'd speak to menu and and we'd say so what what is it that you think is the problem and he'd sort of give a french shrug and go well I, I don't know. Is there a problem? But the times were terrible. Um, but then you speak to Anthony Reid, uh, you'd ask him the same question, and you'd get this kind of 10-minute description of a single corner. And it was golden. <laughs> it was absolutely golden because yeah. we we managed to unscramble that we we just hadn't got the steering geometry right. And with the lock diff, it was it was basically kind of pulling the wheel out of your hands as you as you put the wow. power on and and just uh scrubbing the tires. And so we made a I did a very simple model of the steering geometry, so not a full, um, you know, not a full-blown uh, race car simulation, but just a very simple model, because I knew a few key dimensions and angles that I was interested in tracking as the suspension articulated. Yeah. Um, and oh, yeah, sure enough, they they went into kind of the forbidden zone, and if we took this point and moved it a few millimeters, and it was only I, th- I think uh, we, we ended up moving one point about. 10 or 15 millimeters it wasn't a, like a complete tear up of the of the suspension and then ta-da the steering efforts were back to normal and then ta-da the car behaved properly and then we could move on to the the next uh, issue with the car but it, it it was it was really interesting the the interaction with with the driver i mean i've done those kind of things in things like excel i mean did you do it in yeah, 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 yeah. You can do. I mean, I've never done a kinematic simulation in Excel, but you you can do it. It is just there are some spherical kinematics that you can look up. I could probably recommend a textbook called the Multibody System Something or Other. Who who, who wrote that? Anyone we know? <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe, maybe. I, I think it's a very good book. It's recommended text at several universities. Though. He was looking for someone else clever, but he couldn't find them, so he got me to do it instead. Oh, he's a lovely guy. He's a lovely guy. Absolutely wonderful. And, um, you know, it'd be lovely to have you on the show again another time and maybe to explore some of these other areas in a bit more detail. It's just uh, w- what what I think is fascinating is is just giving people some exposure to the depth and the other ways in which, you know, you can develop a car. People, many people may not have even, like, they don't even know what they don't know about these kind of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's lovely to hear that you've you've tackled things like dampers and got a pretty solid feeling for it. And you've tackled things like the line and you've gone uh, yep. and you've got a reasoned approach for it. And I think people a lot of the time people are just looking for some level of certainty in, in what is it is what is actually a very complicated problem. Yeah. And it's much easier just to ignore it, to be honest, and just, just drive around and Yeah, yeah. 
and hope it's gonna you're gonna go quicker. But then for the people who really want to learn, even the professionals are, are struggling with the same problems. It's if they've had more time to sort. Of yeah, yeah, more 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 time, uh, more test time in particular, and you know budget for tires and all of that kind of stuff. Um, it, it's not lost on me the really luxurious position I was in, just being able to experiment with World Rally cars. That is not a toy set that's uh, available to everybody but no thank you <laughs> thank you very much was, that was that was fascinating and yeah it's been it's been a real a real art now as always so um thank you very much oh thank you for having me what a fascinating guy and i really hope you've been able to get some solid insights there especially on tricky subjects such as the damper the approach to data analysis and looking for that mid-corner speed is not something you hear very often i really hope that gives you something to think about next time you're doing your own data analysis i can't wait to get him on the show again soon to maybe explore some of those other areas in a bit more depth if you like this episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and visit us at yourdatadriven.com.